The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today's webinar. Comics and Academy is hosting our webinar entitled Holotype HLA Typing System, Optimizing NGS to Address the HLA Typing Challenge. I'm Craig Fennell, Sales and Director, Sales and Marketing Director of Omicson. And we have today with us very special guest speaker, Professor Monos, Professor Dimitri Monos from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He's been the lab director of the Immunogenetics Lab for six, uh, since 1996. And he's also the professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at the Medical School of Pennsylvania. Professor Monos is the creator of the Holotype HLA assay together with his laboratory team in Philadelphia. And he's been using the Omics and software for over three years now to fine tune his assay in whilst in development. We also have Tim Haig. Tim Haig was previously the C CTO, the Chief Technology Officer of Omixon, and for the past two years has been the Chief Executive Officer. Tim has a degree in genetics as well as software architecture, and as such has a great oversight in terms of the product, the assay, and the optimization of the software. Just to very shortly go through today's agenda, we're going to give an introduction and benefits of NGS. And Professor Monos is going to talk about his personal experience with the holotype assay whilst in development with regards specifically to the challenges of NGS. And Tim Haig will go through some demonstration of the HLA twin software that is combined with the holotype assay in a live demo showing some of the features of the software that were used to optimize the assay. We'll have a short summary and benefits section before we go into a live questions and answers session. Just one note, please. If you have any questions, which we hope you do, please could you send those to us in the chat box on the GoToWebinar interface, and we will answer the questions at the end in the session. Any questions we cannot answer in that session due to time, we will get back to you separately by email. Thank you very much. Enjoy your webinar today, and over to Professor Mons. Thank you very much, Greg, for the introduction. Thank you, team and Omicron for the hospitality here in uh, Budapest. I'm visiting Omicron's facility, uh, discussing issues of uh, mutual interest as we try to optimize the holotype kit. So, with the opportunity of my visit here, Omicron thought that it would be a good opportunity to have this educational session whereby um, we present you with our experience and the kind of uh, issues we had to address while we were optimizing this, uh, this protocol. Our field for many years has suffered from uh, a technology that would provide a good solution to the HLA tapping problem. And uh, I'm very happy to report <coughs> that NGS, uh, we believe, is the solution to the HLA typing problem. I will start with a small introduction defining the problem. Uh, it is possible that some of these slides have been presented uh, in an earlier webinar we did back in 2013, but uh, they have been enriched with uh, a new work and a new experience we have developed. So I hope that will be a positive experience for everybody. So as you very well know, uh, in the past, we used to characterize uh, uh, the HLA genes by characterizing individual exome, exome, exons we believe were of relevance to the protein, like exon 2 to alpha 1 domain of a class 1 uh, molecule, exon 3 to the alpha 2 domain, 
both of which form the binding site where the peptide binds and it's recognized by the T cell receptor. Uh, and exon 4 that corresponds to the alpha 3 domain. Uh, by doing so, we did not cover a good part of the rest of the gene, including both exonic and intronic sequences. Because of uh, this very fact that we didn't cover the totality of the uh, gene, uh, we had a number of problems. Uh, here I show you uh, an example uh, whereby, uh, because of the uh, absence of uh, intronic sequences in this particular region, uh, it is unclear, uh, since we don't characterize intron 2, uh, whether we have the uh, combination of 0101-1101 or the combination of 0101 null with 1101. Uh, therefore, the absence of these sequences does not allow us full characterization of the particular sample. And defining whether it's a null or not is important in bone marrow transplantation because null means it's not expressed and therefore relevant to bone marrow uh, transplants. Another type of problem is the, uh, uh, up, the particularly with class two, is the absence of sequences of action three. We used to characterize action two, not action three, but action three, as you can see in this example, depending on polymorphisms in action three, like in this position here, you can have a 1401 or 1454. Therefore, that was another ambiguity due to a lack of complete characterization of the gene. And there are myriads of examples uh, of this scenario. Another kind of problem was the fact that because of the extreme polymorphism of these uh, genes, there has been arrangements of uh, actions. Uh, here we can see action two and action three, uh, red and yellow indicating different sequences. And these different sequences can be in a cis arrangement or trans arrangement uh, right below. And whether it is a cis or a trans uh, uh, means that you have different combinations of alleles. And you can have the 1501, 1401, uh, in the upper case, or the 15, uh, 212, 40, 21 in the lower case. Therefore, the uh, necessity to bridge uh, the polymorphisms between action two and action three, and see whether from the yellow you go to a yellow, or from a yellow you go to a red. And indeed, uh, because there are polymorphisms in the intronic sequences, if you characterize the intronic sequences, you can uh, walk from action two to action three, and by doing so, set phase. Another uh, example uh, of uh, problems is due to lack of phase, meaning that uh, we were doing Sanger sequencing, and we had combinations of alleles that were satisfying the red combination, as you can see here, the 0101, 1101, or the uh, 0117, 1119, which is the blue. Whether you had the red or the blue, you had the same electrophorogram underneath. Since you didn't know whether the A uh, faces with the C or the A faces with the G, we were unable to set face, and therefore we had an ambiguity. And this is a very well-known problem uh, in our community. Accounting for the fact that the number of alleles continuously exponentially every year, uh, it, uh, it becomes obvious that these problems we have uh, only multiply. And considering that we expect, as recently published, uh, over 3 million uh, rare alleles uh, at, every, at any given HLA locus, uh, you realize that uh, our field basically would have come to a halt uh, since we wouldn't be able to deal with this uh, level of complexity. Uh, therefore, uh, due to current limitations of existing methods and the increasing rate of new alleles, there is strong demand for a new method for HLA genotyping. Uh, next generation sequencing is a method that can provide a complete solution to the HLA typing problem 
And the reason it can uh, provide a complete solution to the HLA typing problem is because of two major features it has. One is that provides sequencing information for a single DNA molecule, and by doing so, secures phase. Uh, each piece of DNA is characterized separately uh, and independently from uh, the equivalent sequence uh, of the other chromosome. And by doing so, we have phase. Uh, furthermore, it is a high throughput technology, and as such, uh, we, um, uh, we uh, are able to now uh, sequence regions we were not sequencing before, and by doing so, we cover the whole gene, and as such, uh, we are able to eliminate a lot of ambiguities. Uh, this technology was adapted in our field, and um, different groups uh, chose different approaches. Here we have uh, an approach whereby uh, the NGS technology was used, but it was used to uh, characterize only axonic regions and not necessarily the whole gene as it is on the right panel. Our approach from the very beginning was focused on characterizing the whole gene, we thought that uh, the benefits of this technology would be utilized more effectively if we could sequence the whole gene, and therefore we focus on doing exactly that. Uh, I would also like to present you with some data which are on the next slide, showing that um, besides the known exonic sequences that are uh, of obvious relevance, uh, I present here an example where most recently we identified that in an HLA B gene, uh, and the direction of the gene here is from the right uh, uh, to the left, uh, intronic sequences uh, from intron 4, uh, which are the one that is shown underneath, uh, and it's uh, generated uh, as a uh, it's the, the product of, a, of, of the splicing of the primary HLA mRNA transcript within the nucleus is such that it generates an energetically favor, favorable structure, as you can see here. And by doing so, allows a set of enzymes, the RNA3 enzyme Dicer, to cut this uh, molecule at this point where the green sequences start and by doing so, it generates two microRNAs. You can see uh, down here, the, five, uh, the 5P and the 3P, 6891 and 6891, 5P and 3P. And uh, since then, we found that the 5P um, binds two sequences that control um, the uh, uh, signaling in both T and B cells. Therefore, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that besides the uh, benefits of characterizing the actions for the purpose of identifying the allele, we have the opportunity now through the characterization of the intronic sequences to discover additional things that we were not even suspecting that there were uh, within these genes. So we are very uh, excited about this uh, development and uh, we extend the characterization of these microRNAs now to the other HLA genes and to the whole MHC as a, whole, uh, as a total. I'm simply trying to justify why characterizing the whole gene would be more meaningful. Uh, in the future, uh, uh, these sequences, even though presently we don't know exactly what they mean, it's very likely that uh, they can be used. We can go back to our data and identify these sequences and uh, use them as needed and as science uh, suggests. So developing our protocol uh, was um, a, a system whereby we started with uh, uh, the amplification of our samples, of our six loci initially, A, B, C, D, R, B, 1, D, Q, B, 1, D, Q, A, 1. Um, after amplification, we have a normalization step, uh, so we can have comparable amounts of uh, uh, amplicon. 
and these amplicons are broken down by enzymatic fragmentation and repair and adenylation follows. Uh, then ligation to uh, ligate the adapters are necessary elements for the subsequent sequence on the Lumina platform. And the libraries that are generated uh, are then all pulled into a single tube. Uh, we assess, uh, we separate the sizes, so we select the sizes we need for our assay, we quantitate this library, and we, need, uh, we start, uh, we load uh, the MySeq kit for, my, for the sequencing. Uh, this process uh, has approximately four hours uh, hands-on time, and depending on what flow cell we use, a nano cell or a, a full flow uh, cell, it can be from uh, two to three to four days, uh, including analysis. Uh, a few things related to uh, the outcome of, of this uh, work, which is basically individual reads, as you can see here, aligned to a reference sequence. And one metric that is of relevance and frequently used uh, in the lingo of this technology is read depth, which is the number of reads covering a particular base. And therefore, the read depth here is uh, six times, while here is 12 times. And another term is coverage or sensitivity, which is the percent of target bases characterized by a predetermined depth. So you may have a, 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 a coverage that is about 100% if the depth of coverage is one, but you may have 70, 60, 80%, depending on the predetermined depth you want to have. Um, characterize your region. So as the uh, depth increases, the percentage the coverage uh, decreases. And it's uh, important in, uh, in our field to be aware of the significance of this depth of coverage. So this is an example here uh, of an ambiguity, uh, which uh, in our clinical laboratories would have to be resolved since it's an O201 or 301 or the alternative 0235, 03108, uh, including common and well-documented alleles that need to be characterized. So here uh, we have a, a diagram of the length of the gene from one end to the, end, to the other for HLAA. Uh, this is the uh, coverage, and these are actual reads as they aligned the one underneath the other. So uh, basically uh, the middle um, uh, portion here uh, is a summary of everything you see underneath here. And uh, this height from this point to this point is the depth of coverage for this particular um, uh, allele, uh, excuse me, for this particular sample with these two alleles uh, for HLAA. The two combinations of 0201 or 301 uh, are the red arrangement and the other combination of 235 or 301 or 108 uh, is the blue arrangement. And the question is whether we have the red or the blue. And indeed, if you look at the details of the sequences, you see that uh, one of these sequences, or many, as you can see vertically here, has the sequence of GCATGG, um, which is the um, uh, which is one of the red. Uh, sequences here, which is G here, uh, C, A, uh, T, uh, G, G. And as such, you know you have the O301 allele, and if you have the O301 allele, you have the O201, O201 allele, that is the other complementary sequence, uh, and it's satisfied by the consensus sequence, and that's why it's totally gray here. Uh, the, the one, the O201, uh, is the reference sequence, that's why it has no polymorphisms, while the other sequence with the polymorphisms here is the other uh, allele. So that's how this technology solves the facing problem, whereby uh, right at your data in front of you, you can see uh, whether you have the one or the other allele. So as we moved forward to, uh, after we were convinced, of course, that this technology is a good solution for the HLA typing problem, we um, uh, had a number of considerations. The first one was to assess the platforms. There were a number of platforms available, and therefore we needed to uh, make the uh, relevant comparisons and decide which one we would like to use for developing our protocol. 
Here we have some data uh, comparing MySeq and PGM. Uh, you can see uh, on the horizontal axis the different positions of the reads generated by each of these two platforms, while on the vertical axis we see the quality of the reads expressed uh, in, uh, in the thread scale, whereby 20 would mean one error every uh, 100 basis, and 30 would mean one error every 1,000, and 40 would mean one error every 10,000. You can see the MySeq, the majority is between 30 and 40, while in the PGM is between 20 and 30. So overall, the quality of bases generated by MySeq, uh, it appears from this data that it's better. Uh, yellow is the um, uh, from 25 to 70, uh, 75 percent, 25 to 75 percent, and the gray is uh, the uh, width of uh, all the data. The uh, other metric we assessed was uh, the errors um, generated along the uh, uh, length of the read. And you can see that in terms of insertions and deletions, um, the PGM uh, has a, a higher uh, percent error, while in terms of substitutions, they are very comparable. Overall, on the table, you can see that the MySeq platform uh, generates a total number of errors uh, that is um, uh, almost uh, six to seven times less than PGM. So, uh, in, uh, so the uh, MySeq technology was uh, assessed based on these two metrics that was uh, a better technology. And now we are referring to elements that relate to the instruments. Uh, we don't talk about the different uh, protocols for library preparation. Uh, these are strictly measures that relate to the instrument. The next slide, we have an error rate of a line basis this time, not within a single read, but a, rather after these reads have been placed against the length of the gene, what is the error rate generated when you, the, the rates are actually placed uh, in, in the length of the gene? So you can see the length is from uh, 0 to 3,000. Um, and this is for ABC, DRB1, DQB1. Uh, horizontally showing the uh, size of the genes and vertically the percent errors for the different types which you see on the right uh, hand side of this graph that is substitutions, insertions, deletions and the total. Uh, it is obvious from this graph that in terms of uh, insertions and deletions we have a significantly higher rate of errors in terms of insertions and deletions by the PGM, significantly lower by IGM, uh, while the uh, error rate of substitutions is very comparable. The last metric uh, we assessed was the uh, accuracy of uh, homopolymer runs. Here you see um, uh, how a particular um, uh, sample that was a homozygous sample uh, uh, when you account for all the sequences of ABCDRDQ, uh, the number of uh, homopolymer, homopolymers we identified is, are on the uh, upper uh, row, where you see 728, 721, 288, 65, etc. Uh, while on the lower horizontal axis, you see the number of repeats, three repeats of the whole homopolymer, uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And of course, you see the percent accuracy depending on whether you have uh, a MySeq or a, uh, a MySeq, which is the orange versus PGM, which is the blue. So you can see how the, this platform um, uh, has a lower accuracy when it comes to detect the polymorphisms, the, the excuse me, the homopolymer uh, uh, runs. Uh, other considerations for protocol development was the sample selection and primer design. Uh, and uh, we needed to have, uh, we selected to work with 253 samples covering a different uh, ethnic 
uh, groups, a good, uh, we identified some that would cover a good number of uh, alleles in the population for HLA, ABC, DRB, TQ, uh, B. Uh, you can see that here we have higher percentages in each population. And knowing that um, our validation set of 253 samples cover a wide spectrum of, alle of alleles that uh, cover these percentages within each of these populations, uh, we moved on uh, to design primers and uh, amplify each of these uh, uh, loci separately, HLA A, B, C, DRB1, and DQB1. What you see right underneath uh, is uh, a graph indicating the uh, balance of uh, uh, alleles uh, of reads we obtained, uh, reflecting uh, the balance we have in the amplification between the, the alleles uh, of, uh, for the particular locus. So you have HLAA, BC, DRB, and DQB. Uh, you can see that the majority of uh, the cases of the samples had a balanced amplification. Uh, this is the frequency of the minority, so they must be below 50% and most of them are above 30%. Uh, the DQs were the ones that were dropping below 20%, uh, but uh, we will talk later about the combination of features between uh, and, and how the software can come to assist uh, the genotyping uh, by providing, uh, by providing uh, metrics that can identify these minority alleles. Uh, the um, other metric was uh, the relative representation of each locus. It's very important to make sure that when we amplify and eventually sequence, that we have comparable uh, number of reads being generated by each of the loci and by all samples. So we have 16 samples here, 16 uh, amplifications for HLAA, for B, for C, DRB1, DQB1. This group on the right here are pooled libraries. These are individual loci libraries. And you can see that all 16 uh, have more or less a comparable representation of reads. 0.7% would be the expected, the red line. You see that the, there is some deviation, but it's not uh, a very broad uh, variation. Uh, so this is uh, our a typical experiment we get uh, with our protocol. Uh, the other metric that is relevant uh, is uniformity of coverage. Uh, and uniformity of coverage is, of course, relevant because you want to have uh, equal representation in each of these uh, loci because your data are as good as the lowest part. So uh, an alternative uh, protocol we tried uh, through a commercial protocol uh, shows you the variation in the depth of coverage and therefore the risk in regions of interest not to have adequate, adequate coverage. So it is a metric that we take seriously and we want to make sure that uh, we do our best to have a uniformity of coverage. You can see here the results of about 50 or 60 experiments, uh, 50 A's, 50 B's, C's, DRB1's, DQB1's, you can see on the right hand side, and the percent deviation from the mean. So in this, uh, the data in, in this particular presentation, of course, from run to run, we have different depth of coverage, but we have, uh, um, we have calculated everything as 100% uh, and deviation from the 100%. And you can see that the average is the black uh, line, while the yellow is the, from the 25 to 75%, and the rest, the gray, is uh, the totality of uh, the uh, other uh, depths of coverage. So you see how narrow they are, uh, uh, the worst being probably the DRB ones, um, but not bad either. Uh, the next metric of relevance uh, is um, obtaining reads um, that face polymorphism at maximum distance. It is uh, very well known in our community that uh, depending on the combinations of alleles you have, you may have polymorphins that you can easily face because they have uh, small 
at distances, let's say in this particular case, 200 bases. Uh, in other cases, can be three to seven to 400, 800, 900, 1000 plus. And depending on the distance, you may or you may not be able to set phase. And as such, you may or may not generate ambiguities. So uh, the Illumina platform has the advantage that you can do uh, sequencing, um, a pair then sequencing, it's called. So when you have a fragment, you can sequence the fragment uh, from uh, once the one end and a second time, uh, a second read from the other end. And uh, the technology allows you this size to be variable. So you may have a fragment of 400 bases whereby with uh, the 250 read length uh, kit, um, you can have some overlapping sequences here. If it is 500, you can have exactly uh, cover the sequence from one end to the other. And if you have more than 500, uh, cover uh, the ends and allow uh, some sequences not to be completed. However, because you have multiple reads of multiple sizes, you can face polymorphisms that can be far apart, as in this example of B0702 and B4101, whereby you can face this T and this C with polymorphism on the other end, and by doing so, you can identify your alleles. We have a real case scenario here, 0701-41001, whereby sizes of, uh, uh, insert sizes of close to 800 to 700 bases with polymorphisms being apart about 600 bases uh, using pair and 200, phase, uh, 200 base uh, reads, uh, we can face this polymorphism and therefore confidently call the allele 0702 41 and not ambiguities. Uh, another issue is the relative accuracy of long versus short reads. If indeed the uh, long reads are uh, of importance, the question we have is when we can, how do we know what is the maximum length we can use on the Illumina platform? Here we run an experiment whereby uh, amplicons generated from an HLA gene of different sizes. The red is uh, close to 340, uh, the brown is uh, 535, uh, the green is uh, close to 800, etc. Uh, so we generated different size fragments and uh, then in equimolar amounts, we mix them all together and we sequence them. And what you can see here is the results depending on their size, you can see the depth of coverage we had dep depending on what uh, size fragment was sequenced and, and therefore the higher the depth of coverage, uh, that indicates preference of the platform to sequence smaller size fragments as opposed to larger size fragments like 800 or 1000. Uh, so as we increase the size, we understand that this platform will uh, not effectively sequence the larger fragments as it will do with the small fragments. Furthermore, it's not that it sequences um, less effectively the larger fragments, but even, even the quality of the reads of the base calling, as you can see, whether you have a short fragment or a long fragment is different. And when you have long fragments, you have uh, worse um, um, base calling, uh, the, the quality uh, drops. Uh, and therefore, uh, longer fragments uh, don't have as accurate base calling as the shorter fragments. Uh, considering the above, we needed to optimize our protocol to have a good representation of smaller fragment reads that would secure quality and longer fragment needs reads that would secure facing. So um, working, um, we, have, we have identified these optimal conditions where you can have a balanced a presence of good quality and adequate small fragments and uh, less quality, but enough to set phase of larger fragments and by doing so, uh, manage to get an optimal result. Uh, also, the relative accuracy of these uh, two reads, whether it's forward or reverse, uh, excuse me, whether it's from one end or the other end, read one or read two, are of also different quality and this is need to be accounted by the software uh, when uh, base calling is, uh, uh, excuse me, when genotyping uh, is performed. The final element I would like to discuss is the capacity of this system. It's quite flexible. You can start with uh, 
let's say, four samples or 20 loci uh, and go all the way to 90 loci, assuming that you use a balance of class 1 and class 2. For the nanocell that has a total capacity of about uh, 500 million, while a full size, a si a full, uh, size uh, uh, flow cell that is uh, almost 13 to 14 times of higher capacity can accommodate up to 1,000 loci. And of course, depending on how many loci you amplify, you have different number of samples. Uh, we need to be mindful that the cost per sample, uh, uh, of course, goes up as we we use the system for small number of samples. Um, at this point, I would like to uh, ask Tim to continue, uh, giving us a presentation of the performance of the program that has been uh, designed and developed to match our protocol, uh, so we can offer uh, a positive experience for, um, for the users of this system. Tim? So thank you, Dimitri, and thank you for that uh, excellent talk and for being with us today. So it's a pleasure to have you here. So uh, we're now going to switch to, uh, to a demonstration mode, and we're going to show a live demonstration of the uh, of the software. I'm just going to hide this away. So I'm going to show a live, live demonstration of the uh, the Omics and Twin software. This is the, uh, the the version that's currently out and live, which is version 1.0.7 of our software. And we're going to be highlighting a few of the features uh, which will reinforce some of the messages that uh, Dimitri has just been giving us in terms of the, uh, the assay development itself. Uh, I'm going to start off by looking at, at six samples that have been analyzed together. Uh, these are actually Coriel samples. Uh, they were sequenced at CHOP and they were, they were analyzed with the Omics and Twin software. So what you should be able to see now is the genotyping results. This is the high-level results table that we, we display within the software, where we're expecting to see essentially two alleles per locus for this first sample, which, I, which I'm currently highlighting here. Uh, the Omics and Twin software has a very simple representation of quality at the very, very top level, which is represented by the Twin traffic light system. The first of the, the traffic light system reports a, a concordance between the two analysis algorithms that are within the software. And the second one, which is the one we're going to concentrate on today, is the one that uh, reports on the quality metrics that we have inside the software. Uh, and again, uh, there's 15 of those, and we'll have a quick look at these in a, in a bit more detail. So I'm going to choose one particular sample that we've analyzed, jump into the details for that. And uh, actually, I, was, I was, must have been here earlier. I've jumped straight into the quality control screen. And uh, actually, I'll move, just move over here. On the paired results screen, we can see the locus by locus results. We can see which is the, uh, which is the favored allele pair that's been picked out by the software, and which are any other uh, pairs of uh, candidates that could also be uh, considered within this particular sample. Uh, in this case, we've actually got an ambiguous, uh, ambiguous result, a fourth field of ambiguity. This is because uh, these two HLA-A alleles are actually not covered by the sequencing, so we're unable at this point to, uh, to distinguish between these two. Now, in the quality control tab, what we can see, first of all, is uh, the first quality metric we have is the fragment size, which is the average length of the sequence fragment identified by the mapping of the repairs that has been done at each individual locus. So this is going back to Dimitri's point about the fragment size and how important this is. This one at this level just gives you the average. Uh, shortly we'll have a look at the distribution as well, which is also visible within the software. Uh, the second one which is relevant is the read length. Now all of these reads started off at 250 base pairs, uh, but as one of Dimitri's uh, slides was showing on the way past, uh, the, the quality of the Illumina short reads is known to drop off a little towards the end of the reads. So this is taken into account during the analysis. We trim the reads and trim the low quality bases in order to give us a higher quality of result. Uh, one of the most important metrics is the number of reads that we've placed to each of the loci. And, uh, and this one is represented by the read count. Uh, we don't typically need to use all of the data that's available for a sample in order to get a reliable genotyping result. 
However, if the amount of read data we have is too low, then this is clearly indicated in the software. Uh, another one that, uh, that we were talking about was the, the phasing. So over here, we have a little uh, indicator at this level as to whether or not we've managed to maintain phase uh, across the, the full length of the consensus sequence for the two alleles at uh, each, each of the loci. In fact, in this case, we've lost phase in DRB1, so we have a little yellow light to tell you about that. Uh, this is also viewable inside the genome browser where we have a phasing annotation, which, uh, which shows you the, uh, the annotation within the tool. Uh, and the last one I'd like to highlight here is the, is the allele balance or allele imbalance check. And, uh, and as Dimitri said, one of the things that we were attempting to do in this protocol is to balance the amount of data we get for the two alleles at each particular locus. And this shows you the proportion of read data for each of the, for the two alleles at each locus. And again, we have locus specific thresholds for these. So if the, uh, if the, the balance is not accurate, we're able to detect that within the software. And a variation of this feature was actually added very early on to our software in order to help uh, to optimize the primers in the first place when the, when the assay was being developed. So I said I was going to say a little bit more about the fragment size. In the data statistics tab, we have here a table of data at the top. We have a, a, a graphical display of the allele balance or allele imbalance. And we have the fragment size distribution. And this is uh, the curve that Dimitri was talking about earlier with a nice combination of, of uh, small fragments for quality and longer fragments for phasing. This is generated by the software for every single sample. So you can, you can check the distribution of the, of the fragment sizes across each and every sample. We do also have a graphical depiction of the read quality. And this is showing that, as expected, uh, the quality is a little bit lower towards the, the last 50 base pairs of the, uh, of the 250 base pair Illumina short reads. So the last thing I'm going to show in the demonstration today is I'm just going to jump into one of these and go and have a look at this in the genome browser. Now the, uh, the omics and genome browser differs slightly from the graphical representation that Dimitri was showing earlier. Because what we've chosen to do with ours, I'm just going to toggle this reference mask, is that we've chosen to split the reads immediately into two individual signals. So what we can see at the top are the two consensus sequences that we have constructed using a de novo alignment technique from this short read data in order to, in order to, uh, in order to build the, uh, the full picture of what's at this locus. And what we can see here on the gray track is uh, the differences between the two consensus sequences. So in this particular case, we have quite a, a high density of difference between the two alleles. So setting phase for this particular sample is, is fairly straightforward. At the top here, we can see the phasing annotation, which is what we were talking about. So here we have a single annotation. We have a single phase across the whole of the, uh, the gene, uh, across the full length of both alleles. The other thing we can see in this display is the coverage. And as Dimitri mentioned, one of the goals was to get deep and even coverage across the whole of the locus. And this allows us to make the maximum use of the available data on the MySeq platform. This also allows us to scale a bit higher. So because we have nice deep and even coverage for every single sample, for every allele and every locus, that allows us to, to push the MySeq to its limits. And, uh, and to run more samples in a particular run. Further down the screen, we can actually see the two alleles that have been called. So with TWIN, the first thing we do is we, we assemble the two consensus sequences without really referring back to the IMGT HLA database. Once we have the two sequences, then we go back to the database and perform the genotyping call. These are the two alleles that we found that most closely match the consensus sequences that we have constructed from the short read data, which is a HLA-A 02010101 and HLA-A 29020101. So full fourth field resolution. And as you can see, we also have all of the intronic and exonic information across the entire width of the gene here. 
Now this version of the display is showing us the full picture for the whole of HLAA. We can actually zoom in and, and have a look at the chromosomes individually. So by pushing this button just here, this switches the display and turns off half of the display, basically. And now we have a single consensus sequence for one of the two chromosomes. And the allele has been called to match that consensus sequence. So I'm just going to scroll down a bit so we can see the coverage tracks. And as you can see now, all the differences have disappeared. So in this case, the consensus sequence is absolutely identical to the, ref the, the reference sequence from the IMGT HLA database, which is represented by, by this alignment at the bottom. And we can see the other chromosome as well. Same thing applies. The, uh, the consensus sequence is again completely identical to the, uh, to the allele that we've matched this to from the database. And this is a nice visual way to confirm that we have actually got the genotyping call uh, correct. Switch back to the joint view. So the software allows you to do both things basically within a single genome browser, which is to, to have a look at the phasing across, across both of the alleles simultaneously, and then also inspect each of the chromosomes individually within the genome browser if you wish to do so. Uh, the individual view is particularly useful when examining novelties. So if we have a novel allele, we will actually generate two two sequences. One of them is the consensus sequence that we found in the data, and the second sequence will be the closest allele within the, within the IMGT HLA database. In this case, it will not be identical. And again, it will allow you to very easily visualize where the novelties are uh, within, the new, within the new allele. There's also a fast pathway of jumping to that uh, from, from further up in the software, so you don't actually have to to manually inspect it, you can jump directly to it. So here we have a button on the screen which shows you the novelties. If there are any, there aren't any in this particular in this particular allele. So there's nothing to see in there. So, so what we've done then is uh, is to put together uh, a set of metrics essentially to to reinforce uh, the quality of what it is that we're trying to do. Uh, we measure each of those metrics independently. For every single locus, for every single sample, and then uh, at the reporting level, if any of the metrics have any uh, fall below any of our thresholds, we will put either a yellow warning light or a red failed light against the entire locus to inform the user that, uh, that at least one of the quality controls has not been passed. And this is displayed at the very top level of results, uh, so allowing you to see a summary of the, the quality of the run that you've just performed. So, uh, so that, include, that concludes the demonstration part today of the oh, wrong screen. That, includes, that concludes the demonstration. So just in summary then, we can, we can highlight a few of the benefits that, uh, that Professor Monas was talking about earlier in his talk. So the holotype HLA assay has been built onto the most accurate platform, which is the Illumina platform. The primers have been optimized to minimize any, any potential dropouts at each of the loci. The data is very even, both between samples, between loci within an, ind an, ind an individual sample, and also between alleles at a particular locus. The uniformity of coverage across the whole width of, uh, of both of the alleles at each locus is a very important metric. We can do phase resolution. Uh, this is measured both with a quality metric in the software and also with an annotation. As accuracy is there within the assay is one of the highlights. And the other one is the high throughput that we're able to gain through having such uniform coverage uh, across the width of every single, every single gene. Mm -hmm. On the software side, the software has been built to be complementary to the assay. So as I mentioned, we have quality metrics to cover allele balance, read quality, fragment size, and read length, and the phasing. We have additional phase annotations that are viewable in the genome browser. We have the fragment size distribution graph. There's a coverage display. And we're also generating the full length consensus sequences. Uh, as I say, this is being done with the Zenovo technique. 
so it doesn't depend on how well characterized the alleles are in the IMGT HLA database. So you can get more information about what Omicson do on the Omicson website. And we also regularly hold training courses on the Omicson Academy, which is a, a microsite on our website. You can find more information about all of our training courses on there. And that essentially concludes the webinar presentation for today. So at this point, we would like to invite questions if anybody has any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Monas. Much appreciated. Thank you very much for that. Yes, we did receive quite a few questions. And uh, if you would allow me just to, to get that screen in front of me. So one of the questions we've got is, can you get more information? Can you give more information, excuse me, on the fragment size distribution and why this is so important? Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, um, the, the different size fragments provide different quality of base calling and because of the nature of the platform, which is Illumina. So, Illumina favors the sequencing of smaller fragments. Uh, our intent is to optimize the assay. So, we make sure that we utilize the capacity of the system to its maximum, irrespectively as to whether someone wants to sequence only five samples or 50. Um, and to do so, we must uh, uh, m keep a balance between uh, the quality uh, reads that are of smaller f size, so we secure uh, good quality data that will form the basis of genotyping, but at the same time uh, have longer reads that will provide the facing, which is also important for the elimination of the ambiguities. So we must maintain a balance between the short and the long because the different sizes offer different advantages. One offers quality, the smaller size, the other offers facing, which is the larger, size, the, the, the larger fragments. They are sequenced with different efficiencies on the platform, and uh, therefore we need to be mindful of that and uh, tailor our protocol in a way that um, is aware of this, so we don't uh, force the system to sequence large fragments, which will be of lower quality, and by doing so, uh, compromise um, the, uh, the quality of the base calling, and by doing so, challenge the program more in terms of identifying uh, the right basis for every single position, and by doing so, call uh, the right genotyping. I hope that has answered the question. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Um, one further question. Do you use beads in the protocol? We, we use uh, beads in the protocol at some point, but we don't use beads for selecting sizes. Um, we have chosen uh, to use the peeping prep uh, because we aim for a wide spectrum of sizes, and usually beads give us um, restricted uh, size fragments. And you would, you would be forced to do repeated cleanings uh, to select for a wider uh, spectrum of sizes. We also find that it's, this process is not very reproducible. Uh, so the peeping prep is a better way to uh, identify the needed uh, range of sizes. And uh, that's why um, we, we are not using uh, too many of these. Uh, steps that involve uh, beads. However, we do use them at one uh, earlier step, um, that is when we uh, concentrate our library. Uh, but this is for a different purpose, it's not for size selection. 
There's one question. What is the max number of samples that can be processed in a week with one MySeq? Okay, uh, the max number of samples. As I said earlier, we can squeeze uh, 1,000 loci uh, per run using a regular flow cell. Uh, the run, uh, you can easily run on a single MySeq, easily run twice a week, uh, possibly three times. Uh, 1,000 loci, depending on the number of loci you amplify per sample, uh, will determine the number of samples. If you want to characterize for 11 loci, let's say, then um, you will have less samples as opposed to select uh, five or six loci, and therefore you will have more uh, samples. Uh, so, um, so you can do the calculation. I mean, we have provided uh, some metrics like the 1,000 loci per flow cell uh, or the 90 loci for the nano flow cell. And uh, therefore, someone can uh, can calculate, depending on the number of loci, they amplify the number of samples that can be processed. We have a question. Do you plan to include more loci in the future? Dimitri. Uh, we, we have already optimized the protocol for 11 loci. And it will become available soon through Omicron. I presume. Yes, indeed. indeed. Uh, how can we ensure that the primers cover all alleles and that all alleles have balanced amounts of data? Tim? No? Well, um, we can never be sure. I showed that we expect millions of different alleles. Uh, whether we will have a dropout uh, is a serious concern uh, and um, therefore we have worked closely with uh, Omixon's software team here to introduce ways whereby the program can detect um, up to 10% of a minor allele um, and it's adjustable. Uh, so um, if you see a homozygous sample, the homozygous sample is a flag and um, uh, you can choose an alternative technology to confirm that it's homozygous, um, but if you have not uh, amplified it properly, you will never see it. And this is a concern. Um, so there is not an easy answer here. Um, uh, we have tried our best to optimize the protocol. I showed you data from the 253 samples showing that the majority of our samples, the minor allele frequency was over 30%. Um, theoretically, there is no certainty in terms of um, possible um, uh, failure to amplify one of the two alleles. For nano kits, you have mentioned a range of low sign, 20 to 80. What does that mean? And why is that not a fixed value? Oh, depending on how many samples you want to work with. Uh, uh, I was asked as to whether we could use four samples. For five loci would be just 20 loci. We have tried it and it works. Alternatively, someone wants to run more samples. Uh, this is possible. This 90 is an upper limit. Uh, 90 loci is an upper limit, so uh, we, uh, we assist the people in terms of assessing um, how many samples, depending on the number of loci they want to, uh, to type. So if you want to, for 10 loci, uh, you will have close to 9 samples, 9 to 10 samples. Uh, if you have 5 loci, you will have twice as many samples. The data used for the results was exome seq data or whole genome. Which database was used for gDNA or cDNA? It was neither. The data was neither whole genome or exome data. This particular data are data we generate uh, by targeting the genes of interest with primer sets that amplify the genes 
and uh, it is that DNA that it's broken down to prepare the library. It is the amplicons after PCR, long-range PCR. It is targeted um, sequencing here. It is not whole exome or whole genome uh, sequencing data. Uh, question for Professor Monos. Exactly how important is the software component for NGS-based HLA typing? Extremely important. Um, we need to understand that uh, we try to develop a protocol that is credible, that can provide the best possible experience. Uh, the only uh, certainty within the field of HLAs is the surprise. The matching of the a protocol to the software is of extreme importance as the one assists the other in its limitations. Um, as simple as the protocol may be in terms of generating the sequences, uh, the, um, the, the software deals with the outcome which is millions and millions of bases. Uh, this may cause some concern to people, uh, but the reality is that this uh, software has been optimized to deal with this uh, situation. And um, we have brought it to the point that you have not only credible genotyping, but also um, uh, metrics that assess the quality of your run. And this is very important to be understood. As labs are about to introduce this technology in their labs, as people are considering alternative technologies, instruments, and whatever else, uh, it is a, a very important, and that's the purpose of this webinar here, to be aware of relevant metrics. And that's what we have tried to do today, to, to show that uh, the protocol and the software uh, form a combination that is totally dependent from one the other, and um, that's the only way you can have a good experience with this system uh, when the one is tailored to um, work with the other. And it's very important. Thank you, Dimitri. I see we've uh, run out of time for our webinar today. We do have more questions to those uh, that we've not yet responded. Thank you. We will get back to you by email. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants on today's webinar, especially to those of you that have come early morning or late in the evening, depending on your geography. Uh, I would like to add, because I see a lot of questions here, and I, I wish we had time to go through all of them, but if people are intensely interested about a particular uh, topic, they can uh, email uh, me and uh, or Omicron here and we can see how we can respond. It is important for people to be clear as to uh, what can be done and what cannot be done. Thank you very much, Professor Monos, and uh, Tim, thank you very much for that demonstration. Again, thank you to everybody who joined our webinar today. This session will be recorded, and uh, we will put it with our Academy video links up onto the YouTube channel. That's just, we hope the recording was good quality and uh, we wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you very much everybody. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye.